one of the things that people in Wichita remember, and, and not so a po- not so much a positive thing about the Wings, are the Save the Wings campaigns. And so in Wichita in the 80s and, and, and 90s, there were several Save the Wings campaigns where basically the team was like, we need to get X number of season tickets by this date or the team's going away. And um, so there would be a wingathons on television and they'd go out and people would sell as many season tickets as they could. And um, this was not, this was, had left a bad taste in the mouth of some people here in Wichita uh, because they got tired of these campaigns. But one of the things I, I think, I, I think I learned from this writing this book was that um, I think, I thought, well, you know, the team, these were desperate times every time they had a Save the Wings campaign. But, you know, from our interviews, I kind of got the feeling that maybe these Save the Wings campaigns weren't always quite as desperate as the team made them sound. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, gang, how are you? Thank you so much for coming back and uh, joining us on our little uh, rabbit hole of excursion into the uh, world of forgotten sports and teams and leagues and all that fun stuff. The little journey that we call Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast devoted to, of course, what used to be in professional sports. Another fun episode today. If uh, you remember the Orange Army from the 1980s in the old major indoor soccer league, well, you know that I'm referring to the uh, team, the little team that could, called the Wichita Wings. Yes, Wichita, Kansas, uh, aiming higher uh, than its uh, relatively small market size roots uh, and joining the uh, the top echelon of major league sports, uh, and in particular, this uh, amazing, fun, and uh, exciting league called the Major Indoor Soccer League. Uh, the Wichita Wings were quite something. They were a standout. They were, if you will, kind of the uh, almost like the NFL Green Bay Packers type version of of Major League uh, indoor soccer. Uh, and uh, the uh, gentleman behind uh, telling and remembering the story of the Wichita Wings, and it's one that's just chock full of fun stuff, uh, are our guests today, Mike Romalis and Tim O'Brien, uh, who are uh, authors, they are film producers, and they are also just super fans of the old Wichita Wings of the uh, MISL. They also played in the uh, successor NPSL in the in the 90s as well. Uh, they uh, The boys have written, Tim and Michael have written uh, a book that came out uh, in the spring of last year. It's called Make This Town Big. It's a great title. Make This Town Big, the story of Roy Turner and the Wichita Wings. And uh, the book has been so well received. Uh, it is uh, being uh, now uh, translated into a documentary film. Uh, I don't know what the title is going to be. I don't think I asked them, but uh, you could give a listen and maybe maybe we did. Um, uh, they are making, uh, uh, Tim O'Brien and uh, Mike Romalis are making a movie uh, about the Wichita Wings. I believe it's scheduled to come out, uh, and I forgot when they said it was coming out, sometime, I believe, in the early part of uh, next year. Um, and, uh, I highly, uh, look forward to, uh, to watching that. We will have a link to the, uh, uh, the promo for that, uh, video, which they just posted on YouTube a couple of days ago. Uh, but, uh, we're going to be talking all things MISL and in particular Wichita wings, uh, with Mike Romalis and Tim O'Brien here on the big podcast in just a couple of seconds. Uh, stay tuned. It's really fun. Uh, we talk about people like Kim Rontfed and Eric Rasmussen and, uh, there's a little bit of Crazy George in there. Everything Orange Army, we talk about Roy Turner, the coach, of course. Um, it's all good stuff. Give a listen uh, in a couple of seconds after I uh, regale you, of course, with a promotional message from our friends at Audible. Um, if you if you haven't been uh, uh, browbeaten by me uh, yet uh, to be uh, submissively convinced uh, to go try out uh, Audible for yourself, please do so. Uh, it is, uh, it's an awesome service. Audiobooks are, are good for the soul. Uh, they're certainly good for the ears. They're good for the mind. Uh, and there's no better place than Audible to uh, understand the, the beauty of what an audiobook uh, is all about. Audibletrial.com slash good seats. That's your place to get a free audiobook download for you to try gratis for free. Um, you can cancel at any time and you will also get a 30 day trial, free trial of Audible's service. Uh, again, it's audibletrial.com slash good seats. 
for your free 30-day trial of the Audible service and most interestingly and importantly, a free audiobook download for you to listen and enjoy on whatever device you, that you have that you want to listen to said audiobooks. And there's, like I said many times before, there's 180,000 plus titles to choose from. I dare you not to find one that will be worth the time and the effort and hell for free at that. Uh, again, audibletrial.com slash good seats and uh, give it a try. We appreciate it. And uh, so do the folks at Audible. And thank you again, Audible, for being a sponsor of our show and our fledglingness. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Okay. Uh, we are going, of course, not waste any more time. And we're going to get right to our fun chat with uh, the boys from Wichita, Tim O'Brien, Mike Romalis, and uh, we're going to talk about Wichita Wings, soccer, indoor style, coming at you. Well, give me uh, give me some sense, guys, uh, a, a bit of uh, your, your your professional backgrounds, what you guys do now, and uh, perhaps how you uh, stumbled into this uh, story, which you're uh, looks like you're further chronicling about the Wichita Wings uh, for our audience as background. Well, um, this is Tim. Uh, I, I had, um, you know, as a kid, um, I had followed the Wings, not as a, I wouldn't call myself a super fan, but I was a, a casual fan as a kid. I'm 42. So um, in Wichita, it was, you know, a pretty big deal at that time. So I would go to some games and, uh, and then, <clears throat> you know, I had a Andy Chapman Jersey and I'd watch him on TV as well. Um, both local and national television. And, um, so I was a casual fan and, uh, as an adult, you know, I, uh, the wings came back in, a, in another form in 2011. And at the time I was, I was writing for a, a, mag a local magazine here called splurge. And um, I pitched a, that we should write an article about the new Wings team. And so I interviewed uh, the, the GM of the team, and I interviewed Roy Turner, uh, the great Roy Turner, the, who was the longtime coach of the Wichita Wings. And, um, and so it kind of piqued my interest. And so I started going to these new games uh, the, of the new team. And, um, and so I really got excited about it and became a fan uh, of the game much more so than I ever had been as a kid. And, uh, and I had, um, known Mike Romalis since we were in high school. And then we also went to uh, university of Kansas together as well. And, uh, Mike had been a super fan and I'll let Mike kind of take over from there. Yeah, we, um, my family started going, we went opening night of the 1982, 83 season. And I was six, I was six years old. And uh, we were playing our hated rival, St. Louis, you know, the St. Louis Steamers. And, I mean, it was just a phenomenal atmosphere. Not, you know, probably close to 10,000 people in the building, screaming, yelling. Uh, you know, I had never been taken to an event like this before. I couldn't believe, you know, my parents were taking us to this, me, my sister and I. But I tell you, it didn't take long for us to become, you know, followers. Uh, you know, we were season ticket holders. Um, and uh, so for about the next, oh, 10 years until the end of the MISL, I would say I probably went to about 90% of the games. And it was just a, such a big part of my childhood. Of course, like many kids in Wichita, I played youth soccer. And so the wings were a big part of that. And they were just sort of our, you know, our, our version, I guess, of the Kansas City Royals or New York Yankees or whatever it may be, uh, you know, as far as our sort of local heroes. So, and yeah, and so, you know, I had Mike and I would, would watch old games uh, back in, in maybe 10 years ago. Uh, Mike has a collection of, of a very large collection of uh, Wichita Wings games that he's, he's put on uh, DVDs over the years. And, and I remember one day just asking him, you know, I was like, well, you know, somebody ought to, somebody ought to write a book about, about all this. And, uh, and then, um, well, all of a sudden we were writing a book about it. Yeah, we, we, it turned out we were a pretty good team. We, we both brought the, our, you know, kind of our strengths to the project because, you know, yeah, years ago it's, it dawned on me. It was such a great story. The wings were such a big part of Wichita, yet nobody really had talked about them much anymore. And so, uh, you know, Tim's a good writer, and he had a very good way of, you know, organizing the book and editing the book. And I had, you know, sort of the, 
historical background, if you were, and I still had a lot of my uh, programs and media guides and yearbooks and newspaper clippings. So we had, you know, almost everything at our disposal. It was just a matter of, you know, getting the ball rolling, so to speak. And that that ball was was <laughs> got rolling about. Uh, I would say it, it was a year and a half process from the, the first when we decided we had a couple friends of ours that, that I I had been working with in a fan a soccer fan organization a local organization that was promoting soccer of all kinds in Wichita and they had urged me to write this book and so we we met initially with Roy Turner and Kim Runfed uh, the great um, wings player from Denmark. Uh, and said, hey, you know, we want to do this, and will you support this project and help us? And and they were, you know, very enthusiastic about it. And so it was a basically, you know, I I had been I had written for a number of different publications over the years, you know, um, but short form, you know, magazine articles, um, you know, stuff stuff that is a lot shorter than I'd never written a. A book before and so it was a little daunting at the at the you know inception but as we began to interview people and and get started it, it just all it all just started to come together the book almost kind of wrote itself mm-hmm. in a way and um and we had uh it was a year and a half process uh from beginning from the first meeting with kim and roy to the publication and the book, the book that we're referencing, um, came out in uh, May of of last year, 2016, called "Make This Town Big: uh, The Story of Roy Turner and the Wichita Wings." And uh, that book uh, obviously has birthed another project, which uh, you might want to let our audience into that I know about, <laughs> but uh, is not yet fully realized. But, but what are you working on now uh, as a result of that book? Well, the uh, you know the book came out uh, yeah like like you said in May of 2016 and um, was was very successful locally here and we we were a bestseller uh, on the in the local market for for most of the summer and we sold a lot of books on Amazon as well all around the country and um, but we had you know we'd always said when we we started. When we were right while we were writing the book, we were like, "God, I just I wish people could see this." And um, and so um, you know, we in the back of our minds, we had this idea of you know, uh, uh, Wichita Wings the movie. Uh, and so uh, I happened to um, I went to a, a premiere of a of a documentary film called Out Here in Kansas, which is about. Uh, about sexual preference in the heartland uh, and and the Bible Belt, and um, it was nothing to do anything to do with soccer. But the guys who made it um, were just had made a fabulous film. I went to the premiere of it. Uh, a guy named Adam Knapp uh, was the director of this film, and his cinematographer was uh, or director of photography was a guy named Kenneth Lynn. And another man named John Pick also was a producer of the film. And uh, I went to Adam after the, at the end of the premiere, and I said, you know, your next movie should be about the Wichita Wings. And um, and and so over the course of the next few months, um, you know, I kind of wine and dine him a little bit, and and said, so, you know, try to convince him this was this was the the thing to do. And uh, he had, luckily for us, been a fan of the team as a kid, and he had been a reporter for the Wichita Eagle, um, uh, reporting on sports uh, for many years, and uh, and then had kind of turned into this documentary filmmaker, and so it was just a perfect, you know, match. And so for the last, uh, since about May, we've been shooting various interviews and various creative shoots uh that that are that's the becoming this this documentary about the wichita wings uh in the 1980s and um it's 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 going to be it's a really exciting project and it's uh we just we have a trailer a teaser trailer we just put together it's about to we're about to release it to the club to the public here in the next few days and I think people are just, it's very high quality, and it's going to be a really amazing film. Where uh, Where is that going to be? Because obviously this is going to probably air in a couple of weeks. So uh, by the time that this airs, it'll probably be out there if you if you happen to know where it is now or will be. Uh, yeah, the, the teaser trailer, we'll, 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 really, we'll put it out on YouTube. And I, I you'll, you'll be able to ex, uh, access it by 
Uh, we have a Facebook page, uh, Wichita Wings, the movie. Um, also, we're on Twitter and, and uh, on uh, Instagram. And uh, our Twitter is, uh, uh, I believe it's uh, Wichita Wings Movie. And then the Instagram is ICT Wings Movie. If you just search for Wings Movie, you'll see all this social media stuff pop up on your on Google. And um, and so we'll we'll put that uh, link out there when it comes out. And uh, the film itself will will not be done probably we'll probably be releasing it oh september of, of next year so about a year from now i'm i'm guessing it's hard to say but we still are we're traveling to around the we have some trips to we are going to interview andy chapman in michigan and the great andy chapman a forward for the wings who many uh, misl fans would will remember he had played for arsenal as a as a 17 year old and uh, came to America and, and became a star here, and and then uh, Terry Nickel uh, was a great uh, midfielder for the Wings, um, and uh, he's in Ohio. And then we're going to fly to uh, to Denmark and to England this summer and uh, interview a whole bunch of guys, uh, former Wings that are that are out there. So it's a uh, it's quite a quite a project there's a gofundme page for this too <laughs> wink wink if i i i, I need to yeah wichita we yeah, have the uh, gofundme if you just search for wichita <laughs> wings movie at, at gofundme you'll see i believe it's actually gofundme.com slash uh wings movie well, look, it's a testament to uh, <clears throat> you two not being the only ones interested uh, in uh, remembering the story and, and trying to document it. Um, but let's let's maybe get to the beginnings of that. Right. So uh, it's clear both in the book and uh, the way you've uh, set up uh, this uh, this film as it comes together that uh, one of the seminal uh, people involved in it uh, from which the story centers around is Roy Turner. Do you want to give our audience a bit of a sense of of how this, the, the club sort of got going and, and Roy Turner's part in uh, that startup? Well, let me, let me just give a little bit of his background and I'll, and, and then I'll let Mike kind of go into the, the, how he came to Wichita, but, but Roy, Roy was from Liverpool. I uh, was born in, in World War II, um, you know, during the, uh, the Blitz uh, and um, grew up uh, in Liverpool and eventually uh, played uh, as part of the Everton system uh, and, and what is now, uh, the premier league. And, um, and so he had, uh, eventually made his way to, um, a, to America and, and play for the Dallas tornado in the old NASL, uh, North American soccer league. Um, and, uh, Roy was, his nickname was the digger. Uh, he was a, a sp- you know, basically specialized in, in getting the ball. And once he could get the ball from from the other team, then he would distribute it to guys like Kevin Cooley, uh, another great wing, and other other players that played for the Dallas Tornado. And Roy was known as the Iron Man of the NASL. He played a, a, a huge number of games uh, in a row, and um, was um, was very uh, uh, good at just getting the ball from other teams. And so as his playing career came to an end uh, in Dallas, he was very involved with, uh, you know, getting the, the, uh, kids in Dallas to, you know, become soccer players and he'd go around to schools and all over the place, uh, you know, attempting to grow the game. And, um, so then what happened then, Mike? Well, uh, Roy's career was coming to an end, um, in about 1978 and there consequently in Wichita, um, youth soccer was starting to grow. Um, There was a guy named Tom Marshall. And with respect to Roy Turner, uh, Tom Marshall is really the true founding father of the Wings. Uh, Tom was from originally, he was from upstate New York, so he was from a a pretty, you know, soccer-heavy area. And he came to Wichita in the 70s. And he had a son who was playing youth soccer, so Tom got involved in AYSO as like a commissioner. And as participation grew, uh, they realized, you know, we need some more fields for all these kids to play on. And some uh, land uh, became available in East Wichita. And in order to, you know, fund the purchase of this, he staged a fundraiser in the form of a, um, 
of an exhibition game uh, at, at our newly built Kansas Coliseum between um, the Houston Hurricane of the NASL, which at that time had you know Kyle Rote Jr., and uh, of course the Dallas Tornado, which um, Roy you know he just finished his career, but also had players like Kevin Cooley. And so they had this uh, exhibition game on December 1st, 1978, and they brought about uh, 5,800 people to the Coliseum uh, for this, and it was just kind of a big day of soccer anyway with clinics, and it ended with with the game. And then uh, Tom uh, staged another exhibition a few months later between Chicago and Tulsa, and altogether these two games brought in about 10,000 people. So Tom said, well, maybe there's something here. Maybe, you know, this is a good market to have a a professional team. So he started, you know, making calls and trying to make connections. And uh, eventually the original plan was for the Wings to join the old American Soccer League, which at that time was an outdoor league, but they were looking maybe to make an indoor league. Well, that didn't happen, but of course the MISL had just uh, finished up its first season and it was looking to expand. And so between uh, Tom's persistence and um, the uh, backing of a guy named Robert Becker, um, they were able to establish a franchise in Wichita. Um, I don't think, I don't know, the story kind of sounds like the MISL wasn't real keen on a city the size of Wichita joining, but I think seeing that, you know, they had a, you know, there was real money involved, money involved <laughs> and people know how, um, you know, they they just couldn't say no. We, in, we interviewed Doug Verb uh, for the book and Doug had been the uh, director of uh, the uh, press uh, relations for the MISL and he was like, well, you know, we saw Wichita's, you know, it's like, well, they got the money. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, let's see what they can do. And, um, and that's, yeah, Bob Becker had been, he was in the oil business. And so, um, and like a lot of, well, uh, in Wichita, if you have a lot of money, you probably got it from oil uh, originally. And because this, this is kind of what was an oil country. Uh, and so um, Becker had, uh, you know, basically, put the money forth for the team and was the majority, you know, most of the money was from him. And, uh, and they made Tom Marshall, his, um, general manager and, um, began, which led uh, to a lot of, uh, controversy that first year, but, uh, it led into that first season for the wings. What was, what was that controversy? Because, uh, uh, there was kind of a shakeup just before the season started, it seemed. Right. It was it was the week before the first game, so we're talking Thanksgiving week of 1979. And at that time, um, Tom was, I mean, his title was general manager, but about a week before, um, he was let go. Well, I mean, it, I guess it kind of depends on whose story. Some say, you know, he was let go, or maybe Tom resigned on his own volition, but needless to say... Um, they thought that maybe, you know, at least Becker thought maybe too much money was being spent and not enough tickets were being sold. I mean, it's there was a uh, there was a personality conflict I think between Marshall and, and and Becker and Marshall I think resented the fact that Becker had sent in another uh, his his attorney um, whose name was uh, uh, what well, I'm escaping. Ward Lawrence Ward Lawrence. Mm-hmm. Uh, to uh, basically kind of uh, watch over Tom Marshall's shoulder while he was running the team. And, uh, and <laughs> there's a big uh, controversy then about, you know, I think Tom had, had made a statement to the, to Bob Becker that, or to, to Ward Lawrence about how if he didn't get X, Y, and Z, then he wasn't going to be the GM anymore. And so Becker said, all right. And then said, that means you just resigned. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then they, they were arguing in, over in the, in the Wichita Eagle had articles about, you know, one side says this, the other side says this. And Tom Marshall says, I didn't resign. Uh, and I was fired. And, and, uh, Ward Lawrence and Bob Becker said, no, it was, it was the opposite. And, uh, but in the end, uh, you know, uh, Marshall was out the door, and it was a week before um, the beginning of the season, and uh, there was they they still had a, a, a woman named Jackie Knapp, that, Jackie Knapp, who was the um, the uh, PR person for the team, 
And then, so they had to go forward, uh, you know, all of a sudden with, uh, you know, with a whole new, um, new team, uh, or a whole new, you know, group, group of people trying to, to put this, this team together, except for Jackie Nat was the only, uh, you know, person that was kind of left on from the, the first group of people. So, um, it was, it was a, uh, inauspicious start. And so a man named Ray Denton was brought in to sort of, head up the operations of the team, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of, of the thing. And, um, but the, 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 they actually had a pretty good amount of success that first season. And yeah, on the, on the field, they had a very good year and, uh, you know, Roy Turner at the helm. I mean, he, you know, he was the soccer guy and he was very easy to work with. And so consequently, uh, you know, the, the field operations were great. So, well, there was that uh, uh, you you kind of hinted at it. I mean, Wichita obviously not the largest market uh, in the country, right? And the MISL right. at that point, coming off its first season, only had six teams. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm I'm just curious as to like who who reached out to whom first. It seems like perhaps that maybe Wichita kind of put itself on the radar before, say, the MISL was looking at Wichita per se. Yeah, I mean after after the the potential deal to, um, you know, to try to get the wings into the American Soccer League, you know, after that fell through, I mean, the MISL was the next obvious option. And uh, knowing that the league was looking to expand, especially to the Midwest, um, because most of the teams were in the East Coast, Mid-Atlantic, as well as Houston. (laughs) But uh, they put teams in Detroit, they put a team in St. Louis, and so geographically, Wichita was good. Um, But again, uh, given Wichita's size, um, you know, we were always kind of more of a minor league town, you know, minor, minor league baseball uh, we had Wichita State basketball, but we didn't have, you know, a, a history of any kind of major league team like every other city of the MISL yeah. did at that time. Yeah, the Wings were the first major league uh, team in the history of the state of Kansas. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, the Kansas City Royals, Kansas City Chiefs were in Missouri. So, um, you know, it was the it was Kansas's first actual major league team of any sort. And like I said, you know, they I think I think the league was like, well, you know, since they have the money, let's let's see what they can do. And then it became, you know, the wings sort of became and I don't know who exactly made the was the first to make this comparison, but they basically became the Green Bay Packers of the MISL. You know, the they were the the little town in the in this big league with you know, when you go down the list of teams in the, in the league, you know, New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, St. Louis, Cleveland, Chicago, Buffalo, these are all NFL franchise towns. These are all NBA franchise towns or, you know, Major League Baseball towns. And Wichita, of course, was, you know, really stuck out in that way. Um, but uh, despite that uh, lack of uh, size, uh, and in fact, I remember Jackie Knapp said that when they were pitching it to the MISL, they – the MISL had said, "Well, we we need to have X number of people in the metro area. What was it? Five, uh, I can't remember. What they Probably said about five, half a million. Half a million. And, and so Jackie was like metro area. So she drew. She decided. Oh, she drew a really big circle around Wichita to include, you know, some towns that that are, you know, an hour away. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and if you if you push it, you know, at the time you could find five hundred thousand people in a really large metro area uh, within, you know, one hundred and fifty miles of, <laughs> of Wichita, but." Um, so it was a bit of a stretch, but, uh, but, you know, the wings, uh, when they, when they shut down in 2001, were the longest running soccer franchise in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I think that that speaks to, um, and and I think, uh, our, our previous guest, Michael Manchel was kind of hinting at it too, that, uh, there were a number of markets, uh, either because of, uh, struggling NBA or NHL franchises, or in the case of Wichita, the, uh, the non-existence of any other uh, major league sports franchises, especially during the winter season, um, it was literally the only game in town. And in those environments, uh, it 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 made for a, an unfettered presentation and uh, almost love affair with certain yeah. uh, certain fans and certain uh, in certain markets. And I think Wichita clearly was one of those. Oh, well, absolutely. The, I mean, one of the most fascinating things I think is is that you know at that time Wichita had about oh two hundred thousand people 250,000 people in it uh, in the city itself maybe I mean and 
there were 9,000 people going to Wings games the same night there were 9,000 people going to Wichita State basketball games. And so you had this real, uh, it was an impressive show of support for what at the time was actually Wichita State basketball actually at that time was also was doing very well. Um, this would be a uh, um, during the uh, Xavier McDaniel uh, era and, and uh, Cliff Levin Cliff thing. Levin thing era, but um, sure. and and uh, so they were you know Little Wichita was you know filling up two different arenas with to capacity on weekdays sometimes or weekends as well, um, you know supporting you know a lot of you know a significant portion of the of the city was. Uh, was going to was in in either uh, Henry Levitt Arena or or the Kansas Coliseum on on certain nights of the year. Well, let, we'll come back to the fans in a second, um, but I want to kind of just uh, maybe tie a bow around this first season because um, I did the I get the I guess the back up question: w- Did the fans come out in droves during that first season? Was that uh, um, was that a challenge? It took it took a little while. Um, they that, had to paper the arena for a while. There's no doubt about it. Um, but as the season progressed and as the team, you know, the media was very, you know, the media was very good. They had good coverage in the paper. And so I think people came out initially as a curiosity. Maybe they'd get free tickets or something. Um, were the attendance uh, figures somewhat uh, elevated a little bit, you know, maybe a little uh, off? Probably. But uh, overall, you know, people gradually started coming out. And by the, I think by season three, you know, you you had uh, there were there were about uh, four or five seasons there in the early mid '80s, later in the '80s as well, where they were basically averaging near capacity at nine thousand, you know, over nine thousand people a game, uh, in the high eight thousands a game, um, and so. But yeah, it did it did take a little a little bit. But one of the one of the big breakthroughs uh, for getting the uh, attendance up was uh, a game against the San Francisco Fog, uh, which eventually became the Kansas City Comets, right, Mike? Yeah. And uh, but uh, the San Francisco Fog uh, had a, a player named Mancini, uh, who was a bit of a hothead and uh, and also a, a former uh, amateur boxer. And um, he got into it with uh, Jurgen Christensen, the great uh, Danish player uh, who uh, played in the Bundesliga and then uh, came to the Wichita Wings and uh, was a star for the Wings and the uh, MISL Passmaster. Uh, and um, uh, he ended up getting punched out by Mancini uh, during the uh, during a game that was that happened to be televised by. I believe by uh, Cake TV, right, Mike? Yeah. Uh, here in Wichita, and uh, that game was shown, I think, on tape delay. It, yeah, it was shown after hours, and this was in the second season, incidentally. Uh, but uh, Roy Turner, you know, he he made the point in the book that it was this after that game. Uh, that's when attendance really, really started to spike, and this was relatively still early in the season. So yes, yeah, it's 1980. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, all of a sudden people see this and they read the articles in the paper about, you know, go, uh, John back and forth between the San Francisco GM and Bill Kentling in Wichita. And uh, so it was it was a, con- a big controversy and people were all amped up about it. And uh, like Bill Kentling said uh, in, in the book, he, he, he says, I, I loved uh, I loved it when there were fights. It was great for uh for selling tickets and uh and so you know that had happened and then the um at the end of the the first season the wings uh won or got into the playoffs and uh, uh they won uh was it a play in game i believe and uh who was it they played mike well it, this this goes back you know, again to the first season they, it was a one game playoff you know quarter final against uh, the team Detroit Lightning and um the wings literally won it with no time remaining on the clock and um on a, on a goal by uh, Omar Gomez so that really i mean and they had very good attendance at that game as well yeah so. but it wasn't it wasn't enough though uh i guess to uh convince becker to continue uh past that season maybe you can give a little hint as to the drama perhaps that bookended the uh, yeah. the, the start versus uh, the the end of that season 
Becker actually announced that about midway through the season. In fact, it was it, it was an interesting day. It was February twenty fifth, nineteen eighty. He he released the uh, the press release that uh, he was not going to fund the team anymore. And it was such a letdown because the previous day, the Wings had just won a very exciting overtime game at home against Philadelphia. That was also the, the same day that the U.S. Olympic team beat Finland for the gold medal. So then you have this big letdown that uh, Becker decides, I've lost too much money, I will see it to the end of the year, but if you guys want it, you're going to have to find a new backer because this is just not making financial sense for me. The- the league was really uh, not happy about this announcement. They thought it was a, I believe Doug Verb said it was a, a amateurish move, basically. And and uh, you know what are they doing? Uh, you know, announcing this ahead of time. And uh, and I think you know the idea, I think Becker's idea was that hey, I'm gonna you know try to 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 see if I can drum up interest of uh, in uh, uh, amongst uh, people somebody in Wichita to, to buy this team from me. And uh, so, uh, you know, all this is – so through the last part of the season, you have all this drama of, uh, you know, will the Wings come back? And uh, this was really the the first uh, Save the Wings campaign, essentially. And, uh, and so you had uh, an effort to try to find um, people that were willing to buy the team from, from Becker. And so – the Chamber of Commerce here in Wichita, you know, kind of put forth an effort to uh, look for investors, and um, they ended up, uh, uh, you know, having a, even a, you know, like a telethon, and uh, and they ended up finding um, uh, an important person in Wings history, and that was uh, Frank Carney. Uh, Frank Carney was the co-founder of Pizza Hut, and um, and was from here in Wichita and where Pizza Hut was founded. And um, uh, he, along with uh, Jim Hirschberger, uh, who was in the oil business, and uh, a number of other uh, uh, wealthy people here in Wichita, put basically put money in to buy the team, and Frank Carney became the, uh, the senior partner of that group. And uh, they purchased it from Bob Becker, and, and Becker had lost $500,000 that first year. So... Um, but uh, it was it was uh, you know the people of Wichita I think um, came out enough at the end of the season that uh, it convinced these people that this was something that uh, was worth investing their money and their time in. And yeah. and with his arrival, uh, uh, basically a clean out of the uh, of uh, senior management as well, right? Yeah, most of the people that you know had seen the Wings through that first season. Um, I mean, they wanted to make the organization, you know, as good as it could be. So they wanted to bring in kind of some name people. So that started with Bill Kentling, who had also worked at Pizza Hut. He was in promotions and, you know, in sales. And so they brought him in as uh, the general manager. Which is probably the best move they could have made because Kentling was a, a genius at, at promotions and, and generating buzz. And he, you know, he, he was great at, at, you know, putting quotes in the paper that were fiery and, and would generate controversy. Yeah. And well, uh, so before, before uh, we go, Kentling... Yeah, before we go, yeah, Kentling for a second, he, he actually became somewhat even more involved in, in not only the team but the league down the road, right? Yeah, yeah he, he eventually, uh, after... Uh, being a GM of the Wings from uh, 80 to 86, I believe, he right. became the uh, league commissioner, MSL commissioner, uh, and um, was the commissioner for a three-year term. Yeah, so that's a, that's, a, <clears throat> that's a seminal moment, actually, for the league itself, which, you know, mm-hmm. obviously you got to give uh, credit to, uh, to, to Carney and, uh, and his uh, group for, uh, you know, in, in the second year of the team. Right. No, and I mean, it was kind of even slow going the second year because they had received a lot of uh, pledges, you know, going into that second season for for tickets, season tickets. Well, those pledges didn't always turn into sales. So consequently, attendance was was pretty sparse the first few games into the 1980-81 season. And, you know, leading up to that infamous game against San Francisco – you know, I think there were already whispers like, you know, if people don't start coming out, we're, you know, we're just not going to be able to 
fund this again because you said you wanted it now you're not coming out you know so what which is it so after that uh, San Francisco game um, attendance did pick up um, and so consequently they they had some well so I think they had maybe one sellout or near sellout uh, through the rest of the season and then you know in the next few years it began to uh, you know, grow to the point of, you know, Wichita got used to selling out or near selling out, you know, every game of the year. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So the, uh, you know, as a, as a young kid uh, growing up in the New York metropolitan area, clearly uh, watching those games on the USA cable network with Al Troutwig right. and Cal Roach Jr. Uh, those mm-hmm. games in Wichita were, I'm trying to figure out the right word here, electric, I think. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you felt that it was, you know, it felt smaller. I believe the field itself was relatively smaller compared to those of uh, other uh, arenas. And uh, it was just no doubt that the, the sound and the uh, uh, the passion in that building, uh, every game that was nationally televised was was palpable. Right. Well, you know, the the people of Wichita started to, to, you know, all of a sudden realize they had this thing of their own, this professional sports team at a major league level and you could go out and go to a game, and then after the game, you could go have a drink with the guys at a bar called the Hatch Cover, and you could you could meet the players at summer camps, and you could the players might even remember your name, uh, and and the Wings became embedded in the community, and this was a you know Wichita was you know a pretty blue collar community. It was aircraft manufacturing is the base of the of the town's economy and so you had all these uh, aircraft workers who were traditionally you know football basketball people baseball people uh, embracing indoor soccer and then you had the the elite the city's elite at the games you had the middle class you had uh, single women going to the games with their girlfriends you had the whole town of all these different demographics uh, Hispanic people as well uh, come into the games because, you know, it was a Wichita, it was a big deal for Wichita and uh, all these different, um, you know, uh, the city came together to to uh, come to these games and because you felt like, you know, you were a part of the team and and so people were very enthusiastic and, and, uh, and that the fan base eventually got, uh, Roy Turner coined the term the Orange Army uh, for uh, for the, the 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 fans who would you know come out and all, orange everything, and um, and so I think that atmosphere you're describing was a product of that feeling of ownership that the people had over the team that often was literal because you know it wasn't all Frank Carney it was a lot of different people were you know had invested small amounts of money in the team as well. Uh, which is yet another reason why it was, you know, the Green Bay Packers of the major indoor soccer league. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here, is called The National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to, and Audible's got it. By the way, two uh, two guests, perhaps, that we'll have on the show, hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free 30-day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. 
And now, back to our conversation. Well, let's talk about uh, some of the uh, the play on the field, right? Uh, the the Wings were always uh, competitive, especially in the you know for the vast majority of the '80s, right until maybe near the end, uh, as 80, 87, 88, they didn't qualify, but they were they were always in the playoff hunt, and they never kind of quite got over the hump, but. No doubt they were entertaining, right? And no doubt they were competitive and and quite a few all stars on these uh, on these teams that Roy Turner assembled. Oh, without a doubt, uh, the the quality of the play. I mean, Roy Turner played a very European style game. You know, pass, pass, pass. It, I mean, the Wings were always considered a very beautiful team in that sense compared to you know our hated rivals, the Steamers, who were just a bunch of American animals. You know. <laughs> So, so the wings, yes. I mean, they, they qualified for the playoffs nearly every year. Um, and as you said, there was always a hump that they couldn't get past, whether it was St. Louis or San Diego, one of the other, you know, teams that were at that time, uh, the, the class of the league. But it was always very competitive, and we had some of the best players in uh in the league the wings had you know these danish all-stars they the wings just had kind of this pipeline from denmark and, and turned some of these guys into you know players who were, you know were almost just built almost made for the indoor game given their foot skills and their passing skills and their shooting and their sense of the game kim runfit i, I i've always thought he was kind of the bobby Orr of of the misl and that he could he could just do everything he was the great athlete he could he could run like the wind he could shoot he could score i mean he was a defender so you know he kind of ran ran the uh, ran the game on the field and he was a leader and a captain and so he was obviously you know just the heart and soul of the franchise uh, uh, for years and uh, and that of course extended later on to guys like eric rasmussen and uh, jurgen christensen and then, of course, later on, Chico Borja. So we had just some of the most electrifying players in the league. Unfortunately, uh, we just, we, we just, you know, we, I don't know what was missing uh, to time, to finally get past that hump. But you know what? There were a, a lot of very good teams in the MISL at that time, but even they couldn't beat San Diego. And it, and I think it did stick in the in the craw of Roy Turner that that he never got to a finals and uh and of course his you know he and both he and Kevin Keeley um Kim Runfed all feel like they should have gone to the finals in uh in 1981 uh when the the Wings played the Steamers in the semifinals and uh and that year the the league had a uh, final four format where the Top four teams uh, played in St. Louis for the uh, championship uh, series uh, in semifinals and finals, and uh, unfortunately, you know the the Steamers made it to that champion that uh, that final four series in St. Louis, and uh, so they were playing on their home field, and uh, Wichita um, was. Uh, up by uh, quite a bit uh, earlier in the game. Um, was it seven to one, Mike? The Wings were up, yeah, by about four goals going into the fourth quarter, and they were just completely outplaying St. Louis. And up until this time, St. Louis had generally beaten us, but this was so odd that we go into their building. There's seventeen thousand people plus at the old Checker Dome, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, we're just we're turning them inside out. But uh, they didn't quit. The Steamers did not quit. And they staged this amazing comeback, and they tied the game with about a minute to go in the game. And it went to an overtime. Nobody scored. And in those days, if no one scored in overtime, they went to a shootout. A one-on-one against the goaltender, you had uh, five seconds to score. And um, the Steamers ended up winning in the shootout, actually on a penalty kick. Um, I guess the feeling is, you know, at the time there was thoughts that, oh, the referee, um, he didn't call maybe some obvious fouls against St. Louis. Uh, Maybe St. Louis got away with some plays that they normally, you know, they shouldn't have. 
Um, I guess the idea was, you know, we, they, they wanted just to let them play. Um, the, and that, these, at the at the halftime, that that was the, the they they I think Roy Turner thought that that the the league had went to the went to uh, the refs and and said, look, just let them play. Yeah. And um, and then you know the second half was uh, Mike Dowler got injured uh in a very questionable uh play by uh what Steve Petra I believe no it was Don oh, Don Ebert sorry mm-hmm. and uh and so the Wings reserve goalie came in and and uh and it was uh to this day uh Culey and and uh Turner you know believed that they were robbed and uh, in fact we uh we wanted to show uh we wanted to film uh that well I'll just put it like this. Uh, they won't watch that game ever again. They won't w- look at it. They refuse to to uh to see it. So yeah. it, it was it was a very very crushing loss and um St. Louis ended up of course playing New York uh for the championship a couple of days later. New York ended up winning on a goal of course by Steve Jungle. But uh, even New York, I mean, they they wrote a very nice letter to the Wings fans that was printed in the local paper, basically saying, you know, you you guys, you know, you you played a very good game, and we kind of feel maybe you got robbed as well. Uh, but um, that's, it's a touchy subject. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, <laughs> in which in which the but so. I'll tell you, you know, it, it was still very good for the league. It was a very, you know, they never played that kind of format that final for format again because you know the idea of it being a neutral site yet St. Louis is is uh, is in the playoffs I mean you know that's that's silly but uh, it, you know as somebody was quoted later in an article written about that game it was just a great weekend of soccer and I think it did do a lot to help promote the league and that that game was known became known as the the greatest uh, MISL game ever yeah. I mean uh, the in fact the Miss, Missile magazine the magazine of the league had an article I think that was the title of the article the greatest mm-hmm. game ever yeah well uh yeah, obviously clearly St. Louis was uh, you know doing gangbusters uh uh, in the stands, and and it was a, that was a phenomenon, uh, uh, you know, uh, and you can easily see why the MISL and its uh, ascendance would uh, would look at a uh, an environment like that to to hold its quote unquote neutral uh, yeah, neutral situation. Yeah, I mean, right? you know, it was the the league was a blank slate in those days. I mean, you know, they they were just kind of making things up as they went along, in a in a sense. And but you know, you had to promote it, and so you just tried different things, and um, so. Well, we got that sense with our guest, Michael Manchel, uh, and, and I guess I'll as sort of this sort of leads me into a question, which I'm sure is on certain people's minds. Um, did you ever, based on your knowledge and your conversations with folks involved, either and maybe your your remembrances as fans growing up, uh, did you ever get the sense either real or imagined that perhaps the league didn't want to see such a small market like Wichita succeed? Hint, hint. Well, um, I think that, um, again, I, I think that they would have not preferred to have a city like Wichita. I mean, it was called the major indoor soccer league. You know, we're not, we never were a major league town. But again, we, we proved them wrong. Um, we, we showed that we could do it. We had the great support. We had a great building. We had great fans. I mean, we talked earlier, we mentioned the Kansas Coliseum. Yes, it was the smallest arena in the league by numbers, but you know when you had 9,800 9, people in a in a building with a low a concrete building with a low roof, well, yeah, it may as well have been 98,000 people. So, you know, our fans were sort of a seventh man on the field. But, you know, I think later on, you know, Wichita proved again and again, despite its financial difficulties, that the team was wanted in Wichita. And you can't blame, you know, you can't blame the MISL for wanting large markets to do well in the, you know, champion to be in the championship series, you know, New York, uh, obviously the biggest market there is. And, um, St. Louis is obviously a much larger market than Wichita. So, um, you know, it, it made sense for the, the, that the league would want to have big market teams. And because, uh, the league was wanting to become, you know, the the fourth biggest league in the in the country, you know, behind 
NFL, MLB, and NBA, and, and the NHL. Don't or, forget. The well, NFL. no, but they were they were ahead of the NHL, I think, at that time. You know, they, in they, certain they, markets they were, and, and and the NBA for that matter. You know, they they were wanting these big national television contracts, and they were on USA, and then they were on ESPN for a little while as well, which eventually they lost that contract, and that became, I believe, the NHL's uh, Friday night game uh, on on ESPN. But um, so yeah. Any um, so Kevin c- c- to the middle of the decade, right? That's when sort of the next sort of big sort of sizable shift in management and uh, and arrangements for running and, and coaching the team sort of happened. Do you want to kind of walk our audience a bit through uh, the lead up and the follow out from that? I guess a circa eighty five, eighty six, eighty seven. Well, yeah, right? going in to see nineteen eighty five, eighty six. Um, let's see, that was the last year Roy Turner was the coach until well, he later on. Um, the summer of 1986, well, I guess Earl Foreman, I guess he was just going to retire. And so Bill Kentling became the league commissioner. Um, Bill really wanted the job. Um, he felt that, you know, more or less quoted saying that, uh, he didn't feel like the league was marketing itself well enough. Um, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't where it, it, it could have been. So, and there was an interim figure between Foreman and, and Kentling. Yeah, Francis Dale, Frank Dale, was uh, the 85-86 um, commissioner. And then, um, and then uh, Kentling went in in 86-87. And then so Roy Turner moved up to the presidency of the Wings, and then they brought in the great uh, former player Charlie Cook. Uh, to be the coach of the wings. The, so, uh, Bonnie Prince, they yeah. called him in Scotland. Yeah, so this kind of, like you said, kind of started the next uh, change, the next shift in, in the history of the wings. And, and, yeah, that transition also involved the ownership of the wings because the um, at the same time, um, uh, Frank Carney stepped down as the main shareholder uh, the senior partner for the team, and uh, it was taken over. Um, We're getting into an area uh, by Bill Oliver, and uh, Bill Oliver, he's a local uh, attorney, and so he, I mean, he had been involved with the team at, at an ownership level going back to even the early '80s. But by about this time, he became sort of the managing partner. Um, among many, many other uh, general partners and uh, limited partners. So the Wings, I mean, it was, they were owned by many, many uh, people <laughs> in those days. They really had to kind of uh, spread the risk out by then. But this this one seemed to be a bit more stable than, say, the previous change in ownership, right, which was sounds more oh, cri- yeah. crisis-like. Yeah, this was this was a a very smooth transition. It was really just you know Frank Carney wanting to step down as sort of the senior person and become you know he was still I believe he still had uh, ownership uh, partial ownership of the team. He just l- l- decreased his his equity and then Bill Oliver, uh, Bill and Mary Lynn Oliver stepped up and. Uh, um, and took over that role. And so it was, but you had all this change going on at the same time, you know, you had the, the senior partnership changes, the, then, you know, Kenlin goes to the MISL as commissioner. And so then Turner, you know, can't be coach and GM, you know, so he becomes president of the team and Charlie Cook comes in to, to replace Turner. And uh, Charlie Cook's assistant was was uh, Norman Piper, right, Mike? Yeah, Norman yeah. Piper had, you know, he was one of the great original wings, um, the first player, in fact, signed by the wings. And uh, after he had retired, uh, he did, you know, he'd become a, an assistant coach. So. And uh, uh, around this time, and also somewhat uh, stably, uh, a player you hinted at before with a uh, pretty big impact uh, across the league um, for a number of years is uh, Hernan Chico Borja, former Cosmo. Yes, yes Chico came to uh, Wichita after. Um, the Las Vegas franchise had folded in the summer of 1985. And um, Chico, you know, he, uh, you know, he had played for the New York Cosmos. He was an Olympian. He played on that kind of ill-fated team, America, <laughs> NASL uh, team. And, uh, but he had an immediate impact uh, with, I mean, he could, again, great athlete. He could score. He wore his passion you know, on his sleeve, uh, 
to to a fault sometimes because sometimes he would take penalties uh, at not great uh, moments of the game. But he added just a great level of excitement and got people, you know, literally on their feet. And um, like a lot of wings uh, who came to town to Wichita for the first time, Chico, uh, you know, he was not necessarily super thrilled to be coming to play in Wichita, uh, you know, uh, which most of the guys who came here didn't really know anything about Wichita other than that was in Kansas. And they they imagined uh, it would probably be a, a lot of farms and things of that sort and so Chico comes here and he gets he gets to to town at night uh, and uh, is taken to a hotel and uh, the next morning he wakes up over in the curtains and there were cows outside of uh, in, the, in the field outside his, his hotel room and he thought what have I got myself into uh, <laughs> which was the reaction of a lot of uh, of the guys that came to Wichita you know first thing they they, they come here and they're and they're like oh well, this, you know as many of them are you know, Andy Chapman comes here from from Cal- Southern California, and and then uh, other guys are coming from other major cities, and and all of a sudden they're in Wichita, and, and it's uh, a little bit of a of a letdown, uh, you know, comparatively to uh, to the bright lights in the big cities of wherever they had been previously. But but what ended up happening is that you know a lot of these guys fell in love with Wichita because they just fell in love with the people here, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes literally, uh, and married local girls and. And, you know, the fans were so great here, uh, loved the players so much. And uh, so they they were rock stars in Wichita. You know, right. they were uh, – when Andy Chapman put on those leather pants and went out on the town, uh, it was uh, – you know, he got he got everybody's attention. And um, it was uh, it was a special time for Wichita. And, and Wichita made these players feel special because, you know, we showed them the love, you know, when, whenever the team would fly back, uh, to, uh, to, uh, the airport, um, uh, after a, a road game, there'd be wings fans at the airport right. to greet them every single time. There was never a time that they, we, I think it was Kevin Keeley said he could not remember a time that they didn't get greeted at the airport right. by a group of fans. Yeah. Win or loss, they were there. They were there. So, yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing, too. You also look at the attendance numbers you mentioned in the beginning, a little uh, sort of hard to get the kindling uh, sort of uh, uh, caught, if you will, if you want to strain mm-hmm. a, a fire analogy. But, um, you know, you, this was a team that for for the very for the most of the 1980s mm-hmm. uh, largely filled the building, uh, you know, almost 10,000 people per game, you know, eight, nine thousand on a season average. I mean, uh, it was clearly uh, a a love affair between this city and this team for quite a long time that even extended uh, perhaps on a, on a more muted level uh, to when the league itself uh, uh, ended as the major soccer league for that one year. And mm-hmm. and the team went to the uh, indoor NPSL, which itself had been a challenger league uh, under another name um, right. and for another decade or so. Um, I, I'm just curious as what you guys attribute that sort of love, passion, interest uh, you know, uh, fandom, I guess, between this city and uh, the sport and or this team in particular? A lot of it is the genius of, of Roy Turner and Bill Clintley to go out into the community and seek out fans and seek out uh, people. Um, you know, when Roy Turner was in Dallas, he and his coaches, uh, his coach, um, uh, the second coach, Mike Kuma. Al Miller. Uh, Al Miller, yeah. Uh, they just went out and they just stormed elementary schools and high schools and, they, you know, were constantly going out and talking to kids. And that's what Roy brought with him to Wichita. Uh, you know, he came to my elementary school when I was in elementary school more than once. Uh, with the players came out and demonstrated their, you know, soccer skills. And, um, you know, they were going out in the community. They were you could you could meet them at the at the you know bars out you know at the official uh, you know part post game parties and um they were just in on commercials and in local commercials in town and they were just everywhere they even <laughs> one season they even had uh they had uh cars from the local Subaru dealership and the on the side of the car had this Wichita Wings emblem and then the name of the player <laughs> and uh, so the players are literally driving around in Wings cars uh, with their names on the sides of them and uh, they were just ubiquitous around town and um, 
And so because Wichita, you know, realized all of us, you know, hey, we're competing with New York, we're competing with L.A., we're competing with Chicago, all these big cities that, you know, Wichita couldn't find their name next to New York ever before that. And so this competition made people very proud. Um, you know, this is a Wichita thing, and it, it brought all these different kinds of people together to support the team. And, and let's and in my, in my opinion, indoor soccer was a thrilling, is a thrilling sport to watch in person. Uh, it's an exciting sport. You know, it takes all the all the things about soccer that Americans usually don't like, uh, low scoring, offsides. It gets rid of those things. And it brings in these things that Americans do like, which is, you know, lots of scoring, lots of action, uh, fast pace, um, you know, uh, theatrical uh, uh, introductions, all these things that the MISL brought to to sports here in America. And um, so the people of Wichita were just entranced by this. The, the, and then in Wichita had, you know, all these foreigners, um, guys from England and Denmark and Argentina and Germany and, and elsewhere um, come into town. And, you know, naturally the local people were excited, you know, about these, uh, these people with these funny accents, and that that added to the uh, to the uh, the intrigue and the interest of of for the local people, and and, uh, and you know you you could run into Roy Turner at the at the supermarket, and and uh, he talked to you, and uh, the same with the players. So it was an intimate fan experience, uh, sometimes very intimate uh, for yeah. some of the local ladies in town. Well, and yeah. speaking of which, we we also have to mention, of course, the Wings had the uh, Wichita Wings Angels. That was you know the cheerleading dance troupe and they were you know I think they were as you know they were ambassadors for the for the team as well and so you know if you're a single guy you know you're not gonna mind you know meeting some of those girls as well so. although the uh, kissing booth uh, <laughs> that was a mistake uh, yes, they, yes. they had at one event uh, decided to have a kissing booth with the angels and uh, they, they we interviewed some of the angels and they they particularly did not enjoy the the man with the uh, who had the, the chewing yeah skull man or skull, skull man they kept whatever. coming back for the, the <laughs> kissing booth but uh but yes it was it was an intimate fan experience and you you know in ways that larger cities couldn't ha- replicate in the sense that you couldn't go hang out with George Brett in Kansas City you, you couldn't go hang out with Reggie Jackson and in uh, New York, and um, but you could hang out with Andy Chapman and and uh, and Kevin Cooley and Kim Runfed and all the guys here in Wichita. So um, that led to a people felt like. In fact, one of the fans uh, was interviewed for a marketing uh, video for the team at a game, and uh, he says, you know, this this isn't Roy Turner's team. This isn't uh, this isn't uh, Bill Kentling's team. This is my team. And and that encapsulates why the wings were so popular because people felt like it belonged to them. Right. And it was affordable. They always wanted to make the tickets affordable. And, you know, maybe it wasn't great for the bottom line for the wings, but they really never uh, raised ticket prices all that much. And they wanted to, you know, make sure that families could afford uh, to go to the games. And so... You know, you'd go to the game and you'd grow up. You'd literally grow up, you know, with, with some of the people in your section. So uh, in putting the book together and obviously now in the process of putting this movie together, um, you know, obviously you were fans. You, you clearly understood and, and, uh, and uh, experienced what it was to be a Wings fan uh, mm-hmm. during those times. But uh, have you learned anything in the book and or in the process of doing this movie that uh, came as a surprise to you or... Uh, that you did not know about uh, during that time, or well, you want to um, save you want to save I, that for the debut of the movie. I, I learned a lot more than Mike did in the sense that Mike was a super fan. I think Mike didn't know the actual dimensions of the the players' waistlines, but now no, <laughs> just kidding, Mike. Uh, but the no, he uh, I one of the things that I I found interesting was. Uh, when we, you know, the wings. One of the things that people in Wichita remember, and, and not so a po- not so much a positive thing about the wings, are the Save the Wings campaigns. And so, in Wichita in the 80s and, and, and 90s, there were several Save the Wings campaigns where basically the team was like, we need to get X number of season tickets by this date, or the team's going away. And um, so there would be wingathons on television, and they'd go out and 
Steve would sell as many season tickets as they could. And um, this was not, this was, had left a bad taste in the mouth of some people here in Wichita uh, because I got tired of these campaigns. But one of the things I, I think, I, I think I learned from this writing this book was that um, I think, I thought, well, you know, the team, these were desperate times every time they had a Save the Wings campaign. But, you know, from our interviews, I kind of got the feeling that maybe these Save the Wings campaigns weren't always quite as desperate as the team made them sound. And I think essentially what they were were um, it was a way for the team to measure the community's support. Because the, the 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 people that were funding the team were willing to go spend more money and lose money again next year as long as the people of Wichita were willing to come out and buy season tickets and go to the games. And um, there may have been a bit of theater involved in some of these Save the Wings campaigns where it wasn't quite as desperate as they made it sound. And so that was, that was something that I did not realize. And that is an... I would say maybe not everybody would agree with that statement, but I think if you really got to the the bottom of it, I think that might have been the case. Mike, what about you? Well, I yeah, they they um they made the numbers known how much they had lost. And I mean, they lost a lot of money. I mean, we're talking, you know, 30 years ago when they're saying uh, you know, we lost 607 or 700,000 dollars. Well, maybe in the world of professional sports now, of course, that's minuscule. But in those days, I mean, that's, you know, the equivalent of well over, you know, a million dollars now. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, again, revenue streams were relatively, um, you, you just didn't have that many. I mean, like I said, they didn't really ever raise ticket prices. You had your advertising revenue. Uh, you had maybe some merchandising revenue. There was really little TV money. I mean, indoors, it was just a very, very expensive thing to put on. I mean, you're, and you're paying these world-class players really what they should be getting paid. I don't know. Um, Did it, you learn anything, Mike, from, from writing this that you well, didn't Well, I, I was trying to think about that. I, 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 I'm sure there, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, uh, you know, that, was, that really knocked my socks off. Um, I guess, honestly, you know, even when I was researching, even in the old newspapers, I guess one thing that was interesting to me was the fact that the Wings were originally conceived as an indoor-outdoor type franchise. I had never seen that written anywhere um, in, in any of the old publications. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that it's it's interesting uh, or important, frankly, to understand sort of that time in uh, American soccer history, right? Because during the mm-hmm. 1980s, as the NASL uh, overexpanded, floundered, and then ultimately uh, collapsed in 85, right? You mm-hmm. you had in its wake, uh, you know, some decidedly minor league uh, soccer franchises, but nothing near the... Uh, the allure and the stature of the NASL and the right. major indoor soccer league literally was the only soccer game in town, an indoor variety. Right. And it was the, you know, everybody was sort of writing off the sport of outdoor soccer as boring and foreign and, and mm-hmm. you know, it's, it, it's uh, tedious and, and all that kind of stuff. And yet you had this amazingly uh, alluring and tantalizing product on the indoor circuit and, uh, and fans just uh, ate it up. Um, right. As as outdoor soccer has finally, you know, gained solid footing in this country, I, I like to think that at least one contribution we've made, you know, to soccer history is that realization that for about you now close to ten years, indoor soccer, yeah, it was the only legitimate professional uh way to play soccer in the United States. And and it's um you know, I think it's hard for people to even to realize now uh how big indoor soccer was at that time. I mean Chico Borja uh, was uh, left the wings uh, after the '86 season, I believe it was, yeah. or '87 season. I can't remember now, but uh, he was signed away by the LA Lasers, who of course were owned by Jerry Buss, uh, owner of the LA Lakers. Uh, they signed Chico Borja to a three-year, uh, million-dollar contract uh, in 1987 or '86. Um, that's a lot of money, um, and uh, it's especially in, in today's dollars, that'd be even more money, of course. And um, so, uh, you know, guys in Wichita, Kansas, were making $100,000 a year in, in 1985 money, 
playing for the Wichita Wings. Not every guy, but you know, that, you know, Kim Renfed, the top level guys at that time in Wichita, were making around a hundred thousand dollars a year to play indoor soccer in Wichita, Kansas, um, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and it just goes to show that uh, the MISL was was a legit league with very top level talent. And you know, I I know uh, the guys. Uh, Roy and and, the, and some of the other players feel like that the talent level of the MISL was actually better than the talent level of Major League Soccer now. Um, they felt like the Wings could beat a lot of these um, MLS teams now. And I'll tell you, I, I'm, I, I can't I can't speak to that. I'm not a, a big, big good enough soccer expert to to tell you whether that's the the case, but that's what Roy Turner thinks. Well, I'll tell you, you look at some of those uh, old clips from those some of those MISL, MISL games, and I, they were intense and and, and skilled mm-hmm. and and you know I so I guess two sort of wrap up I guess questions here uh, as we uh, segue to uh, conclusion. Um, number one, do you think um, uh, the phenomenon of the Wichita Wings and or high level top caliber indoor soccer uh comes back at any time uh in the future and 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 can it go or was it kind of a once in a lifetime kind of thing and then number two um any residual effects i guess from the wichita wings experience uh in relation to where soccer is today um i don't notice yet a a team let's say in wichita in you know the division three usl or the division two nasl or or any of that uh, unless I'm missing it, um, what routes were left and, uh, and what is the future of soccer in, in, in the city? Well, I think to take your second part first, the, um, the impact of the wings in Wichita on soccer was profound in the eighties in the sense that you had every kid, not every kid, but you know, seemed like every kid, uh, going out and playing soccer, um, wearing wings uniforms. Um, those kids grew up, some of them became wings later in the 90s at the end of the franchise. Um, some of those kids went on to play in uh, Major League Soccer. Um, many of those kids are now running soccer teams here in, in Wichita. Um, the, uh, there is an outdoor team in the uh, – the new NPSL, um, which is the, you know, amateur, uh, semi-pro league. Um, it's called FC Wichita and, uh, you know, it's composed mostly of college players who play here in the summer. And, uh, but yeah, you're right. There is no, uh, currently no, um, uh, soccer team, professional soccer team in Wichita. Um, the city of Wichita actually is, is, Probably about to build a baseball soccer stadium downtown. Yeah, there um, was actually a, just an article in our paper just the other day about the potential of getting a, what a Division Three USL team. Yeah. yeah, that that is the so. the the scuttlebutt is is that we're going to be getting a, a double A uh, baseball team and then a USL team, um, and I think that would be very good for the city. Um, and in terms of indoor, you know. Uh, the Wings came back in 2011. A local businessman named Wink Hartman, uh, who's also in the oil business, um, like the original um, uh, Bob Becker, owner of the Wings. But uh, Wink Hartman brought the Wings back for two years in, in, the, in the successor MASL league, uh, MASL number three or two. I can't remember how many of them there have been now. Uh, and, um, and then there were two more years of another team called the Wichita V 52s where it were in the MA, MASL. And, um, you know, I think, uh, indoor will probably return to Wichita. Um, but, um, it's hard to imagine indoor becoming what it was back in the 1980s ever again. It's, it's hard to imagine, uh, that level of of play and big deal that it was then, partly because of Major League Soccer, um, and uh, but there are people who are trying to make that happen. And you look at uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the futsal um, uh, leagues that are that are in being planned right now, but uh, I believe Mark Cuban is has money in in the uh, one of these futsal professional leagues that uh, Keith Tozer, I believe is the person in charge of. Um, and supposedly it's coming to NBA markets 
in the next year or two. Um, now, obviously, futsal is not the same thing as, as indoor soccer as we're used to it. Um, but um, the, the of course, you know, the court, the, they use a basketball court, and, and it's so it's smaller than the MISL arenas were and are smaller than the fields were, and they don't use the boards. But, um, I, you know, I, I think I think indoor soccer can become something again, but uh, something more than it is now. But I doubt that it could ever become what it was in the 1980s, just unless there was some sort of collapse of the of major league soccer in America. Yeah. I mean, there will be a place for it. As long as you have players that you'll have a place for indoor soccer. I mean, the MASL, it, it still exists and there, there are franchises all over the country, but you know, the, the, if you're, if you're wanting to be a player, if you're wanting to play pro as a, as a living, I mean, obviously MLS is your, that's the ultimate goal now. Yeah. It's a double-edged sword, but, right? I mean, you know, the success yeah. of MLS and, and all the things that sort of came before it and, and we can argue whether, you know, it's still artificially supported and should there be pro pro promotion and re- relegation and all that kind of stuff. I mean, those are, those mm-hmm. are separate topics for a different time, but you know, make right. no mistake, there is a stability to the outdoor game or the classic game, right? That uh, clearly did not exist in the eighties uh, has yeah. uh, eluded, uh, you know, uh, this in the, in this country for, for quite some time. And, you know um, but, but to your point, you know, I, I think it's extremely important whether it comes back as futsal or or there is another v- variation of it to come or the MASL, you know, and it's a relative, um, you know, uh, unevenness, I guess, across the, the franchises that are that comprise that. Um, you know, I, one thing when the uh, uh, National Soccer Hall of Fame comes back online physically next year in Dallas or just outside mm-hmm. of Dallas in Frisco. Um, you know, I remember going there a couple of times uh, when it was in Anianta before they uh, uh you know, sort of went dormant for a number of years. Uh, there right. was nothing really uh, even uh, uh, alluding to the indoor game, whether it was the NASL variety or or either or the MISL. And right. I, I, there, there were uh, there were always people in the soccer world who resented indoor soccer. They resented the success of indoor soccer in the 80s because they felt like it was a bastardization of the sport. And once Major League Soccer began to become powerful and eclipse the indoor game, they were more than happy to bury indoor soccer. Um, they didn't, you know, there are people who never liked it because, you know, it wasn't the the game that, that was being played around the world. And um, and I think that that's unfortunate that that there were people with that mindset because indoor soccer did have a should have a place in and I think in a in a perfect world indoor soccer would be a off season place for players who were playing professional outdoor soccer to play in um, but that has sort of become very difficult because the major league soccer season seems like it lasts uh, 13 months every year yeah. and uh, it, it's a never ending season that, that has very little uh, off season in it. And, um, and, and of course those teams are not willing to let their players play in a, in a, another league in the, in the, in the, in the indoor league in the winter. But uh, you have seen USL and NASL players playing both indoor and outdoor um, in the last, you know, 10 years. And I think that was, it would be a perfect uh, scenario for you know being building indoor soccer as this off season league that guys can play in to hone some of their skills you know but uh, you know you run into the problem of owners not wanting guys to to do that but um that's why you know you have some teams cedar rapids I- iowa has a an indoor team that and they also have an outdoor team in the summer and so it it's for you know second division soccer that that is a, a good idea i think well it's also probably a way to keep uh, allow professionals to stay professional completely without having to do the side job thing and and all that yeah. kind of stuff and, and look this is what the nasl and you hinted at before the old american soccer league were kind of envisioning sort of this indoor and outdoor thing i mean we've had uh we had uh terry uh hansen on uh a couple episodes ago who was part of the atlanta chiefs and you know he regaled us in stories about how you know outdoors you know, at the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, 55,000 seats, and they were maybe drawing five or 6,000 if they were lucky a game. Yeah. Yet when they switched to the indoor season, right, they sold out the Omni time and time again. Um, so it look, at the regardless of sort of where you fall on this, I mean, t- to deny that uh, the Wings, the MISL, the 1980s, uh, early 90s, you know, uh, was not part of the building blocks that, uh, you know, supports 
a uh, a robust and still growing uh, professional soccer environment in the United States, largely on the outdoor side. Uh, I mm-hmm. think that has to be rectified. Uh, and perhaps I, I hope maybe that, your you movie know, comes out that at that time. That the Hall of Fame is going to be in Dallas. Uh, maybe you know there will be a push to recognize the old MISL because, of course, Dallas was a great franchise. The Sidekicks were a great uh, franchise for years. Tattoo and everybody. So um, I, I, I would really hope that uh, you know, if for no other reason, the location we could we could get the MISL recognized at, at, at you know in the in the Hall of Fame. Well, the timing of your movie coming out sometime next year, I think, would be uh, uh, very appropriate. So uh, we'll try to keep that. To, we'll put a pin on this conversation and maybe okay. some of our uh, our vaunted listeners who have some pull uh, in uh, in soccer uh, history and uh, and the uh, the Hall of Fame, et cetera. Uh, we might be able to sort of make something happen. But before we run, guys, sure. um, I want to thank you. This has been awesome and a, and a tremendous yeah. uh, deep dive. Um Remind us again, give us some of your uh, promotional uh, opportunities here for both the book as well as how they can, our fans can uh, keep uh, an eye on what you're doing with the film and maybe even raise their hand and contribute something, perhaps something that eludes you. Oh, yeah. The, uh, you, to buy the book, uh, you can go to Amazon.com and uh, purchase it as a uh, physical book or also a Kindle version. And um, if you're interested in uh, donating to the film, um, you can just go to the uh, GoFundMe page, which is GoFundMe.com slash uh, Wichita Wings movie or Wings movie. I can't remember. I should have had that written down. But uh, And then um, you can follow us um, on Facebook at uh, Wichita Wings the movie. Uh, we also have a Make This Town Big uh, Facebook page as well for the book. Um, MakeThisTownBig.com is also we have a website that believe has a link. Uh, yes, to, yeah, make this down big dot com. Mm-hmm. And then uh our uh, Twitter uh handle is ICT Wings Movie. Um ICT Wings Movie and then we're also on Instagram uh at uh, Wichita Wings Movie. Um and so any of those uh, we're I I am uh I'm always on social media putting things up for uh um about the film and about the movie and um and so um, we'd love to have people contact us on there and uh, interact with our pages and uh, buy the book, donate to the movie, and uh, follow what we're doing. Keep the wings memory memory alive, indoor soccer memories alive. And I should yeah we have a we have a wings beer right now actually. <laughs> um, there is a local brewery here in Wichita called Aeroplanes Brewing, which is uh, just we just came out with the Chico Beer Ha. Uh, the uh, a American wheat beer, uh, which is uh, dedicated to Chico Borja, the great uh, American player from originally from Ecuador, and uh, a dollar from every uh, pint goes to the Wichita Wings movie. And uh, unfortunately, it's not in bottles yet, but uh, you can. So you have to be in Wichita to get it. But uh, yeah, so we're uh, we're trying to take over the world. All right, fun times, live and exclusive. Uh, I don't know if it was live. It, it certainly wasn't exclusive. Uh, however, it was, for, it was definitely from Wichita. Thank you, Mike Romalis and Tim O'Brien. And uh, we uh, eagerly await uh, this uh, documentary film about the uh, Wichita Wings. Uh, and uh, you can participate in this process. Uh, so get ready to write these down. So uh, there's a GoFundMe page, gofundme.com slash wingsmovie. Uh, so you can contribute and be part of uh, of the festivities and uh, maybe get a little uh, uh, promotional item uh, in exchange for your support of uh, of the film. Uh, you can follow the uh, the movie on Facebook at uh, Wichita Wings the movie. Uh, you can go to their website, which uh, refers to, of course, the uh, the book uh, from which this movie is emanating from, called Make This Town Big dot com. Of course, that is also the name of the book, Make This Town Big: The Story of Roy Turner and the Wichita Wings. Uh, there will be a link not only on all these places uh, to that book, but you can find uh, a link uh, for that book uh, on our website, GoodSeatStillAvailable.com. Just search for this episode and you will find uh, that. Uh, if you want to follow the um, the exploits of the movie being made, uh, you can also follow them on Twitter at ICT, the letter I, the letter C is in Charlie, the letter T is in Tom, Wings Movie, ICT Wings Movie, at ICT Wings Movie, that is, uh, on Twitter and on Instagram, uh, you can also follow them too at Wichita Wings Movie. That's all one word. 
Uh, no shortage of places to keep up with uh, Messrs. Romalis and O'Brien as they uh, uh, continue their journey into uh, making the uh, movie about the Wichita Wings. Again, the book as well is available now to whet your appetite while we all wait. Uh, and again, it's Make This Town Big, the story of Roy Turner and the Wichita Wings. Uh, find it wherever good books are found. Um, so thank you to them. And of course, thank you to you for listening. Uh, please, uh, by all means, uh, keep going to our website, goodseatstillavailable.com. If you've missed any episodes, uh, you want to download or find uh, supplemental information, books and movies, etc. from such, uh, that's the place to find it. Good seats, still available dot com on uh, social media. Of course, you can follow us and please do so. We encourage that as well. We love uh, chatting with you in that form and fashion. Uh, that's uh, on Twitter at at Good Seat Still. Uh, you'll find us on Instagram at Good Seat Still Available. And uh, you will also find a Facebook page devoted to uh, this here little show as well. Uh, before we go, we do want to thank, of course, our friends at Podfly Productions who make this sound uh, dandy, uh, much dandier than I uh, give it to them in raw fashion. But uh, the uh, folks, uh, they know who they are, but let's uh, tell the audience as well. It's David Gregerson, Corey Coates, Eric Begay, and of course, Jerry Payne, uh, Podfly Productions. That's podfly.net. And uh, if you need help with your professional sounding podcast needs, uh, that is the place to go. And frankly, too, if you're thinking about starting a podcast and uh, just are a little intimidated by the whole process, uh, Podfly is uh, a really good place to help you through that process. Podfly.net. Podfly Productions, the name of the company. Thank you, guys. Uh, without you, I can't do this. Um, and without you, the listeners, I can't do this. I appreciate your support, uh, your cards and letters. Uh, keep them coming, as they say. And uh, we uh, are encouraged and enthused by your uh, your passion for what we're doing and um, lots more good stuff to come. My name is Tim Hanlon. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week. And uh, until then, take care. <laughs>